Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevan Davani. I'm really looking forward to my next special guest, Andy Edstrom, the author of Why Buy Bitcoin with the subtitle Investing Today in the Money of Tomorrow. It's a really uh, excellent book. You should definitely read it. it uh, I, like, I love the style of writing. I love the research he did, uh, his expertise, his background knowledge. So it's, it's really worth reading. And, you know, in times of, uh, you know, infinite money printing, brrr, you know, the, the viral meme that's been going around and FDIC, you know, is this uh, weird institution that uh, allegedly, you know, secures or guarantees, uh, assures, you know, um, the, your, your deposit in, at least in the United States, I know, um, has been coming out and saying, oh, you know, uh, you shouldn't put your money under the mattress. So it's really secure. Uh, since 1933 and blah, blah. So this is the sign that you should, you know, uh, think about as soon as possible, withdraw your money, put it into hard, hardest money, such as Bitcoin, or even if you want, you know, gold or whatever. Um, you know, it's not financial advice. I'm just saying, you know, do your own research uh, first, educate yourself, but, you know, you need to take human action as the Austrian economists say. Anyway, really looking forward uh, to talking to Andy Anstrom. Uh, the author of Why Buy Bitcoin. And if you have any questions afterwards, please let me know if you, uh, and any other comments, questions, topics you, uh, you want me to discuss with other um, authors or Bitcoiners, experts, let me know. So thank you so much for listening. And without further ado, this is my interview with Andy Edstrom. Thank you so much for your listening and for your support. Bye. All right, uh, <laughs> Andy Edstrom. Uh, author of the book of this really amazing book. Uh, Andy, welcome to the show, first of all. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Kayvon. It's great to be on with you. So listen, I, I ordered your book, but then, you know, it didn't arrive. I was at my girlfriend's house, so I, I downloaded it on, on her uh, Kindle because I usually don't, don't you know, read Kindle. I, I like, you know, physical books. <laughs> so anyway, so I read it, and some of the chapters I even read twice. And I was really blown away. It's uh, not only your style of writing is uh, really blew me off because, you know, usually I have some, sometimes I need some time to dig into the style of writing, but um, now to the content, uh, it's, it's really, I was really surprised because uh, you go into depth when it comes, uh, what interests of me, you know, is like the structural problems we have, the, the cause, you know, not the symptoms. And, you, you go really, you elaborate, you go really into the rabbit hole of the criminal, yeah, I mean, you know, how, how else do we wanna, you know, not only unethical, but criminal procedures, processes, workings, background of this, you know, financial banking, uh, monetary central banking structure uh, in collusion, of course, with the governmental uh, positions uh, that, you know, that these people also uh, 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 fill, fill in. So, let me, you know, uh, if you, if you like to, can we talk first about, do you want to like, uh, what's your approach to this whole, uh, to this whole narrative and to this whole, you know, to these factual backgrounds? How did you, how did you, how did you get into this research? First of all? Yeah. Okay. So first I'll do the usual disclaimer, which is, uh, none of this is investment advice and these are opinions. These opinions are my own and uh, not those of my employer, uh, Westcap group. Um, so we got that out of the way. Yeah, regarding um, regarding the system and the problem of let's say regulatory capture as well as you know criminality, and you could, I mean, you could separate those two, I guess, or you could argue that they're uh, related. I would probably say that they're uh, that they're related. But um, how did I get into the research? So. The first part was the easy part, which is I used to work in that. I, I used to work for him, <laughs> right? I used to work for Goldman Sachs before the financial crisis when a lot of the shenanigans uh, was going on. Um, I was just a young analyst um, and, uh, you know, so I didn't have great grasp of what was going on at the time. There were inklings of it. There were hints here and there, and I wrote about some of them in the book. Um, and then, of course, the global financial crisis happened, and a lot of this stuff came to to light. And so that, I guess, prompted my um, my research of it. I had begun reading about it after I had left uh, the bank, and when I was working at a distressed 
investment fund called Tenenbaum Capital. And so part of that was just, you know, attempt to understand, you know, what the heck was going on um, as it was as it, literally as the financial crisis was playing out, you know, when Lehman filed, well, first you had the Bear Stearns, you know, funds blow up and then you had Lehman file for bankruptcy and then you had all these rushed acquisitions among all the banks. And so I was left scratching my head. And, um, and so I, 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 you know, I definitely spent some time reading and researching at that time. And then as time passed, I just, you know, as a professional investor paid attention to what was going on in, in the industry. And I noticed that uh, a lot of the problems, you know, weren't solved. They didn't go away. Um, government didn't, government probably had the opportunity um, to, to solve more of the problems that were uh, in existence in the financial system whether it relates to um, you know people being in and out of the private sector and government and uh, helping out their friends and cronies um, and making sure that uh, you know making sure that people high in government regulators in particular had nice cushy jobs to uh, to go to after they left government and could uh, could make their large payouts right get paid because government doesn't pay nearly as well um, whether it was the uh, you know, whether it was the leverage embedded in the system, that's sort of the one area that I can say, okay, there was some progress with respect to, you know, the banks used to be 30 to 40 times levered and now they're only 10 times levered. Now, a footnote to that is based on, you know, valuations, you know, what's, what's fair valuation of these assets? Well, we're finding out right now, specifically uh, in the debt markets, literally as we speak over the last week, we're figuring out that, quote unquote safe you know uh safe paper right safe fixed income investments whether those be government bonds whether those be uh, real estate uh, especially right the mortgage-backed securities market has totally blown out um so the market is struggling right now to find what is fair value for these things and so we've got this confluence of um We've got this confluence of a liquidity problem and too much leverage and deleveraging, right? So that's going on. It seems that some of the very large head funds, especially the risk parity funds that use leverage on fixed income assets are having to unwind these things. So you're getting forced selling and that's a quote liquidity problem. However, uh, what we're going to find out in the coming months is how much of it was truly just a liquidity problem and how much of it was a solvency or evaluation problem, right? Are houses in the U.S., you know, are houses in my neighborhood, you know, really worth 10 times the annual income? Um, they have, that's where they've been selling for the last, you know, few years. But um, we could see a repricing in, uh, in those kinds of assets, um, just like we already have in the stock market and, and other risk assets. So, so I digress um, from your original question. Um, but yeah, I've, I've sort of lived the... I've lived and observed the, um, you know, the prop, pro the problems with the existing banking system and financial system, you know, my, my whole career. And over time, it's just kind of become more and more apparent that we have those problems. Now as to the specific, you know, criminality of the banks, that, that was a couple things. One was if you read the wall street journal or the New York times on a regular basis, like, <laughs> How can it not just hit you over the head, right? I mean, it's just scandal after scandal and problem after problem. And it's, you know, whether it's the, whether it's literally the, uh, you know, HSBC working with the Mexican cartels and specifically designing, uh, you know, systems in their banks that will fit the right size briefcase full yeah. of cash to launder money, or it's the, you know, fixing of LIBOR which is probably the most int important interest rate in the world, you know, other than the, than the 10 year treasury uh, rate. Um, and, you know, there's literally tens of trillions, if not hundreds of trillions of, of dollars of notional um, assets that are tied to that thing. That was, you know, rigged and manipulated. The metals market was manipulated. Um, You've had obviously the Wells Fargo, you know, situation where they basically committed fraud and, and illegally opened millions of customer accounts without, um, you know, without the consent, consent of the account holders. And um, it's just all this stuff. I mean, you can't, 
you can't have been reading the news for the last few years and not have noticed the the criminality um, that's going on in the banking system. And so so then when it came to writing the, writing the book, it was really just a question of, okay, what are these scandals that I literally remember off the top of my head? Quick Google search, you know, find the Wall Street Journal article or the New York Times article or the, you know, Economist article that, you know, that reported on it, you know, do the citation. And, and so that's where the internet's an amazing thing, right? If you have a few ideas in your mind and you remember these things and you might not remember all the details, you might not remember exactly when they happened. Um, and of course, the most the the most egregious example being probably the most recent, which was this Danske Bank um, case, where literally over two hundred billion euros, which is equivalent to more than uh, two hundred billion dollars, was laundered through a single branch in Estonia. I think it was right um, over a period of uh, of years. And so that's the one that's sort of most recent and most most egregious, and that was you know that was like a year ago. Um, so that's the that's the long and uh, winding answer to uh, I think your question about uh, you know yeah. how how I got into the research on this yeah. stuff. It wasn't really... unfortunately it wasn't that difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. You see, the thing is, I mean, I really because I, I I really went into you know deep into the rabbit hole of the Bank for International Settlements, and I'm like. You know, as much as we want to understand and as much as we, you know, we are bombarded with all kinds of mainstream news and this and that story, but at the end of the day, it's like the tip of the iceberg, you know, it's like how deep, like th these are like factual things that we can prove or have been, you know, in a court of law or something or actually they haven't been or they've just been fined. That's what they, you know, um, it's sort of a trade off these, these institutions, these really huge institutions are doing. So, um, and it comes, you know, I, you know. Before I forget, uh, your your book title is uh, uh, "Why Buy Bitcoin: Investing Today in the Money of Tomorrow." So I like your title because, um, you know, it goes to the core of of this question: Why buy Why buy Bitcoin? I mean, uh, first we need to understand, you know, the legacy traditional monetary financial system before we go even into the, uh, you know, in, into the alternatives or into the uh, op, you know. Uh, um, potential solutions of, of what is Bitcoin, why Bitcoin. So uh, do you want to like um, recapitulate what's been going on the last couple of days and weeks? Uh, just to yeah, have, like, sure. Um, I'll listeners. try, I'll try to keep it short. It's almost, you know, we could probably spend uh, all afternoon talking about it. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll cite a couple examples of, you know, what's happened as well as, you know, my thoughts, you know, today and, and earlier. So, um, you know, last Friday, um, I, I tweeted, uh, that within a week, you know, majority of, uh, of us cities would be under curfew. Okay. Six minutes later, <laughs> six minutes later, you can't make this stuff up. Oh, the city of Los Angeles announces a broad curfew. And that's where I live, by the way. I, I did not have any insert. Yeah. I had I no inside information on this. Yeah, I guess it's much more stricter than over here in Austria because it's pretty relaxed over here in Vienna. You know, you don't get like, uh, just just asking. I mean, is it like super strict or, or how? I mean, look, I, people are definitely, you know, walking by. They're taking walks. You know, they're getting exercise, which I think is good. I mean, I think they're mostly staying away from people. There's not much traffic on the roads it's not totally deserted there's definitely people driving around um you know banks are open um so yeah i mean it's not i based on what i've read it's not nearly as strict as you know china um yeah. or even potentially italy right now um so yeah it's not sort of eastern it's not eastern country or asian country uh, level of lockdown by any stretch of the imagination but you know, you've seen basically, uh, you've seen uh, states and um, cities, you know, municipalities so far, you know, come out and do this. And by the way, it's been liberal, right, democratic states and municipalities, right? It's New York, it's LA, state of California, you know, city and state of New York. I think more are going to fall into place. I was having actually this argument on uh, sort of on email with a friend of mine, um, very good investor, you know, who I've known since college. And he takes the view that, 
is in in the U.S. You know, you can't basically impose lockdown. Um, I still like my chances on my one week prediction that the majority of the U.S. population will be under curfew. Because remember, it doesn't have to come from the president. It might come from the president, but it could come from, you know, states or cities. And uh, frankly, um, you know, it's the liberal locations, right? It's the left-leaning, uh, let's see, say more socialist or more communal uh, areas where most of the people live. So anyway, we'll see how, how it plays out. So that's, so that's one thing that's, I think, surprising a lot of people. Um, the second thing that I, I tweeted out on March 13th was I was reading at the time about what a disaster this um, virus situation is and how the current administration, right, the Trump administration totally blew it. And um, they did blow it. But guess what? So did everybody else. <laughs> um, so people were talking about, you know, this is the, you know, this is the end of the Trump administration. Um, and what I tweeted out uh, on the 13th was the opposite, right? My personal, I personally put odds of Trump's reelection now at probably close to 75%, right? Mm -hmm. Which is really high for a presidential reelection. Why? <laughs> well, we're now on a war footing, right? Um, and wartime leaders, for the most part, get um, get reelected. I'm sure you've been looking at, you know, what's going on in France with Macron as a good yeah. example. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish that a single Western country had gotten this right. Um, but I can't think of one, right? So like, yes, China did the lockdown, although they started late. Uh, Singapore, you know, seems to have done well. South Korea seems to have done well. Well, those are Asian, Asian Eastern countries. I mean, the the relevance to our way of life over here is, um, it's just not that relevant. Um, so when it come, you know, come re-election time, when Western voters, American voters specifically, are looking around and saying, um, you know, did this guy, basically did this guy blow it or not? Um, it's going to be, I can't think of an example, you should interrupt me and tell me of a, of a Western country, basically, that, that has handled this thing, you know, right. So, so he looks no worse, basically, than his peers. And, um, and moreover, you know, who is it that suffers the worst, let's say, from uh, a highly contagious uh, disease, you know, in an environment where you're potentially subject to lockdown? Well, it's the, it's the left-leaning, you know, democratic voting states, <laughs> right? Um, if you're living in a rural area and you've already done your prepping, right? You've already stockpiled your, uh, you've already stockpiled your goods and you've got the weapons to defend them. Um, you're not as worried about this thing. Uh, and rightly so. Like this is a disaster for people in New York City. It's not as much of a disaster, you know, for people in rural America and rural America is where, um, is where his, Trump's voter base is. And moreover, it's yet another, you know, nail in the coffin of globalization and, you know, this, uh, this concept of the liberal elite, you know, the left-leaning liberal elite, um, and this notion that, you know, hey, everything open is the right thing, uh, is the right thing to be. Surprise, surprise. Now we are, because we don't control our supply chains, you know, because we can't get masks and we can't get ventilators, you know, in time. Um, potentially in time, we're going to find out. Isn't that really um, strange, uh, Andy? I mean, yeah. you know, uh, we have so many resources, we have so many companies, we have, we have uh, you know, there's so much, uh, you know, real put, uh, put resources. I mean, why, why can't, why can't, uh, why can't there, you know, be a, like a, f uh, uh, you know, innovative approach to this, like, you know, uh, getting out these test kits? What's, yeah. what's happening here? I mean, it's, it's yeah. really strange. It is, it is disappointing. I mean, definitely there's some government failure. I mean, specifically, as we know, the FDA was not helpful in this respect. Um, so there's that, um, there's definitely that piece of it. And then part of it is the testing is one thing, you know, and then the, de the having enough, you know, ICU beds and ventilators is another thing. Um, there's definitely little, there's little doubt that our system is not set up for you know, peak demand, right? Or peak, we don't have the capacity for peak demand. Um, and that is all related to the root of capitalism or one of the roots of capitalism or really specifically fiat, you know, money and debt money supported uh, capitalism, whereby 
you keep just in time inventory, you squeeze down your working capital to the very minimal amount, which is good for, um, you know, it reduces your total cost of capital. It's good for your share price. But if you have a problem, man, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's centralization and living on the edge. And it's the opposite of robustness, where robustness is about decentralization, about not having too much concentration, about having you know a little less optimization so that when shit hits the fan, you've got a little bit of a cushion, a little bit of a buffer. Um, but yeah, it's been uh, it's been somewhat surprising to see uh, to to see the you know the healthcare system's um, response to this. Uh, and this is another discussion I was having with my colleagues. You know, my one of my colleagues <clears throat> took the view, hey, you know, this could be a real interesting opportunity to invest in healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. um, there could be a lot of investment in the space and growth in the space uh, upcoming, as well as obviously demand for medical services. Mm -hmm. And I took the opposite view. I said, you know, if the U.S. already spends double as a percentage of GDP on healthcare compared to Europe, as you know, right? I'm generalizing, it's different in each country. Mm -hmm. But but on average, you know, if we spend whatever, 17 or 18% of GDP on, on healthcare and, you know, I don't know what Austria spends, maybe 10 probably would be my guess. Um, and we're getting no better outcomes. Uh, you know, this this is actually, this could be the straw that breaks the camel's back on nationalizing healthcare. We'll see. It might not, and it might not soon, right? I mean, if Trump gets reelected, it probably won't happen. But, but if and when we get a you know democratic sweep of government, um, you know, people people could look at this situation and say, you know, are, this really expensive healthcare system that we've had in place for so long that already wasn't really getting us better outcomes, you know, except for uh, extreme cases. Well, now it failed us utterly. You know, what uh, what are we doing here? <laughs> right. So the yeah. so this uh, SARS uh, Corona whatever COVID nineteen virus is uh, one way or another it's a convenient um, you know uh, event and and excuse for all the governments to uh, you know to disguise or to try at least you know attempt to disguise the the real causes of 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 uh, you know of all these of of the mess we we've been in you know uh, with another you know starting with the brrr, <laughs> uh, this meme that's been going around. So, so where do you see this going? I mean, are we going to get out of this, or are we going to go, you know, into a totally, uh, you know, different extreme? Uh, like, uh, yeah. Go so, so I have a few thoughts on this. One is one of the things I wrote about in the book. Right, I dedicated a couple pages in the book um, specifically to the upcoming intergenerational struggle. Okay. Um, and this was at some risk to myself because the majority of my clients are much older than me. Okay. They're baby boomers. Um, some of them are older and they don't understand how much they've sucked out of the financial system already, mm -hmm. not only by virtue of the fact of the, you know, outright entitlements, right. That's Medicare and social security, but also by virtue of the fact that they, you know, they had careers and they accumulated wealth in a period when as a society, we were living beyond our means. Right. And that basically accrued to their uh, to their investments um, and their savings over time. So, so what what's happening right now is gonna, is very interesting because we're we're faced with hard we're faced with uh, with actual financial calculations and numbers. So, and I'll tell you how I'm thinking about that. So, first of all, we don't we don't know you know what the death rate will be from this thing. That's number one, but it could be substantial. Okay. And, you know, estimates are that it could be, let's say in the U.S., we got three, whatever, 350 million people. You know, we could have a couple million people die of this thing. It could be worse or it could be better than that. And it obviously depends on what policies are enacted, right? Whether you're in favor of the, of the lockdowns and social distancing or not, um, you know, it, it seems to at least flatten the curve. Okay. So... So now we get into questions of, well, who's going to be hurt by this situation, right? And what is the magnitude? So, so who's dying, right? Now, look, I'll tell you my personal view. I've been personally in lockdown. I haven't left my house in nine days, okay? Um, 
I do that for a few reasons. One, I have a couple of kids, one of whom, you know, doesn't have great health and I don't want to expose them. Two is, even though I might not die this thing, like I don't really want to get a bad flu, you know, for a week with a risk of, you know, having to go to the hospital. And, you know, I need to be in shape basically to continue to do my job and, and serve my clients and that stuff. Now, look, I'm lucky. I can do this, right? There are plenty of people. I can work remotely. I've been set up to work remotely for years now already. And so it's not, it, and I have, you know, like a decent house, you know, I have enough space, like being locked down and holed up at home is not such a sacrifice for me. It's a little bit of a sacrifice, but compared to, you know, the average American or the average person around the world, it's not that great a sacrifice, honestly. So it's kind of, it's easy. It's relatively easier for me to do. Now, so then the question is, okay, who's at risk? Well, on average, obviously, it's mostly older people, right? They're the ones who are much more likely to die so far based on the statistics we've seen. So, and then we got what's Congress doing right now? We're talking about a $2 trillion um, stimulus package, okay? And that's literally just, it's $2 trillion of deficit spending, right? It's $2 trillion at least of debt that the U.S. government will incur, you know, to quote unquote help people out. Well, who's going to benefit and who's going to lose from this whole, you know, lockdown situation? Well, obviously, it's the old people that are going to benefit disproportionately. Why? They're the ones at risk, right? They're the ones who are much more likely to literally die of, you know, this thing. Whereas the young people, you know, who don't have accumulated assets and also aren't, you know, are much less likely to get very sick or risk their lives, you know, they're, they're getting laid off, you know, literally by the millions um, cause they're the ones working the service jobs, you know, that are basically getting gutted. So they're, so they, um, they don't have nearly as much to lose with respect to health, but they have a lot to lose with respect to, you know, earnings and well being. And then the opposite is true for, for older, gen the older generation. So then you get in the question of like, well, is it worth it overall? Well, let's say that 2 million Americans might die. And let's say that's going to cost us two trillion dollars okay because that's the number that's being you know kicked around right now i mean we'll see what congress announces okay is it worth spending two trillion dollars to save two million lives i think it depends on whose life it is right that's a million dollars per life now back in my keynesian economics days right studying uh, studying economics at university they told us at that time that you know when the economists try to value value a human life, you know, the economic value, they come up with pretty big numbers, you know, on the order of 10 million. But remember, that's, that's based on expected life productivity, uh, right? So then you have to say, well, what's the expected lifetime productivity of a 70 year old? <laughs> well, actually, it may be zero or near zero, because they're already retired. So you're going to saddle a young, you know, the younger generation with a, a bunch more debt, you know, to protect the lives of the, of the older generation, you know, at the cost of, you know, a million dollars uh, a life. I don't know. We're going to find out. But I can tell you that uh, the, the burden of this whole situation, the financial burden, is not going to fall evenly on, on the population. And then there's a, there's a further issue, which is so far when you talk about, you know, uh, wealth loss, let's say, you talk about, you know, stock market loss you know, who's lost money? Well, obviously, wealthy people, wealthier people have lost more money in the stock market um, than people with less wealth. That's actually, you know, running counter to the narrative of, you know, uh, extreme uh, and widening wealth inequality, um, at least in the short term. But when you think about portfolio construction, because that's what I do for a living, the older you are, actually, in a lot of cases, the more bonds you own, or the more low risk investments you own, you own and therefore sort of the more insulated you are against loss. Now that's a generalization. I mean, there are plenty of, of older people own lots of equities, right? They own lots of stuff. So their portfolios, have, you know, have, have gotten whacked um, to some degree, but it's actually the younger, the younger risk, to, you know, younger generations who are taking more risk with their investment portfolio and or the sort of middle-aged people in their peak earning years who've already accumulated some assets, but still have, you know, a strong skew toward riskier assets. They're the ones who, uh, who, who are suffering most, um, at least as a percentage, um, with the market losses in, in recent days. 
So anyway, all of this is going to lay bare to a greater degree the sort of uh, skews and inequities between the generations. And yeah, it's it's going to be um, it's going to feed into politics. It's going to be um, problematic. You know, I've tried to warn my clients that this conflict is coming. Some of them, you know, know it. Some of them of them have realized it more recently. Some will still be surprised. Um, it's going to be a it's going to be a reckoning. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, I have a lot of other thoughts about what, what else is going on in financial markets, which I'm happy to talk about. But. All right. So those two trillion that you're talking about, this is just a minimum, right? I mean, we're talking about like uh, if this process goes on, um, wouldn't that be like um, compounded probably to five to ten trillion i mean it's being injected now into them you know artificially into the market it's like really with the physical money printing or digital uh you know uh money printing or credit expansion by order of magnitude so where is this money going what, what kind of effect does this have you know on also you know since we, it's about bitcoin uh what effect is going to have on bitcoin and gold and what is happening you know right yeah. now in the situation yeah so yeah, so a few things there. The short answer is we don't know. We just don't know how much money's going to get printed. I mean, they basically they've literally the Fed literally announced. You know, they had the whatever it takes moment, right? You know, Mario Draghi did that in 2011 in Europe, um, and now we've done it here. Uh, so it's it's a blank check. It's literally, as you say, money money printer go. Brr. It's uh, there's money getting printed as we speak. You know, assets are going to be bought directly, you know, assets that hadn't been bought before. You know, before it was only basically government debt, that's treasuries, and uh, mortgage debt, you know, in, in previous rounds of yeah. QE. And now they're going to buy also co corporate bonds, right? I mean, it's... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the next. It's So basically, it's everything but stocks so far. Um, yeah. Everything but stocks and Bitcoin, mm -hmm. <laughs> as far as we know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who knows? Maybe that'll happen uh, before too long. Um, so, yeah, so so potentially unlimited uh, money printing. Now, you know, those of us in this space, probably, you know, you, most of your listeners, me, like we know, we've known this has been coming. I mean, I dedicated, you know, a couple chapters in my book specifically to the debt problem, right? And And, and the fact that printing money is probably the only way out. Um, and so, uh, so there's that situation. With respect to gold, um, I'm really happy, you know, that my clients own gold. Um, we put that in the portfolio for the first time, I think in 2016, and we've been increasing it, you know, mm -hmm. basically since then. Um, and gold is like the obvious short-term beneficiary for all this, because gold is the historical hard money, right? Now, Bitcoin, I believe, has a very good chance of becoming, you know, the future hard money. Um, and so it should be very good for Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. I can think, I can sort of imagine scenarios for why, you know, a truly deep depression and um, you know, really off the rails, or, yeah, right. really off the rails government policy could be bad for Bitcoin in the short term. But if, you know, if we don't get a Great Depression, it seems that this is just more evidence that owning hard money, hard to produce money, inflation resistant money, you know, is going to be a good idea. So I am very bullish on gold. I am very bullish on Bitcoin. And um, these, these two assets actually may be the assets to own in this decade. And, you know, we can debate, okay, you know, will, Bit will Bitcoin take share from gold? Yes. I think Bitcoin will take share from gold. Oh. Nevertheless, I think the total aggregate demand for hard money will be so large and will increase by so much that both of these assets um, are likely to perform well. And for a broadly diversified portfolio, you know, you ought to own both of them. Right. Yeah. Um, what about, um, I don't know who that was, was that Pelosi or whatever, let's just call it the Trump administration. They proposed uh, digital, uh, you know, fiat dollar wallet. Um, mm -hmm. um, it would be sort of connected to a, a, a Federal Reserve account or some kind of member bank, a credit union, like any like affiliate bank. Um, 
So it would be like purely digital then, centralized, of course, so it's fiat money. So do you think that would facilitate and accelerate the transition to critical mass adoption, a critical adoption rate of Bitcoin? Yeah. Because of the, the pending, answer, because of the danger of hyperinflation. Yeah. You know? so. yeah, yeah. The short answer is, I think that, well, the short answer is, I don't know and we don't know. And I did write some of, about this in the book. Um, it, it depends greatly on the form it takes, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's literally, you know, private key based and it's direct access to this ledger mm -hmm. and it's sort of, you know, independent of the banking system, it's effectively that the citizen has an account with the Federal Reserve, um, that would be a pretty interesting development. However, I think it's highly unlikely that it happens. Why? Because circumventing the banking system will, you know, severely, potentially severely reduce the depository base of the banks. And that would be hugely disruptive to their business. And A, uh, it seems that the government wants to keep the banking system, uh, you know, functional and solvent. Uh, you know, whether that's, whether because that's a good idea in general to keep the payment system running, which is actually true, or it's because uh, the banks have captured government, which is also true. <laughs> so, for, you know, for, whether for good reasons or bad reasons, that, that seems to be the case. So I, I have to confess, I, I haven't dug into the details of, you know, preliminary systems that have been proposed lately. Because these are, I, I don't think I've seen anything that's sort of risen to the level of, oh, this is likely to get implemented. I mean, you've seen some ideas come from, you know, individual Congress people, and you've right. seen uh, sort of white papers, you know, published by the Fed and others. Um, so we'll see what happens. I really kind of doubt that it's going to be a true, you know, I doubt that we're going to see a system like I described soon, just because it would be so potentially disruptive to the banking system. And I, it's really hard for me to see that government is going to be, uh, you know, willing to do that anytime soon. Mm -hmm. What yeah. about the universal basic income? Do you think it's, I mean, do, do you have any choice? I mean, because if the shit hits the fan, I mean, uh, wouldn't they like, isn't that like the, the, the most rational, uh, you know, alternative uh, or choice, to, you know, to execute because of the, of the danger of, you know, a civil war. I mean, I, if, if this thing goes on, I see, you know, real huge disruption and, 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 uh, you know, m millions or, you know, hundreds of millions of people, um, on the streets, uh, don't you see like the danger of really impoverished, uh, society? Yeah. 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 Big time. If, when you get mass unemployment, which yeah. is, which is what we face, if there is, you know, a long-term, you know, curfew and quarantine, right? Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, you know, unemployment claims are already skyrocketing. So we're already starting to see it. Yeah, if people don't have income, and as we know, by the way, most Americans, and frankly, most people in the world don't have any significant savings, right? Um, they don't have enough money to pay the rent and buy groceries, you know, for more than a month. Um, there's a lot of Americans, as we know, that, you know, can't, they don't basically have $400 in their, in their checking account. So yeah, you got to keep these people, you got to make sure these people can literally, uh, live their lives. And that's why they're talking about literally, you know, mailing checks or as you suggest, you know, having some digital distribution system for, for getting cash to people. The problem and maybe this gets to your earlier question, you know, with that, with the implementation, I mean, there's a lot of problems with the implementation. It's hard to implement. It's hard to get, although checks in the mail and you know, the system, the mail system are slow. Um, at least they're already in place. Um, you know, rolling out and implementing a mass digital based, you know, UBI system. This is where people are talking about, well, you know, is like, this is a, U.S. government going to roll out a new crypto dollar system, you know, specifically because we need a uh, payment of UBI to people right now. Which it would seems be so unlike... difficult to implement, I think. You know, it's just a centralized, you know, data ledger. You know, the more centralized, the easier it is, right, to roll it yeah. out. Yeah, in theory. <laughs> in theory, uh, that's true. Remember, mm -hmm. governments aren't very good at, at turning on a dime. Mm -hmm. um, 
they're actually pretty good, you know, at taking a year or two, you know, to get on a war footing and mobilize the machine, but they're not that good at doing something, you know, in the span of weeks or, or a couple months. So I agree with you in premise, um, but as a practical matter, I just see the execution risk of that as being rather high um, and just sort of, it adds complexity to what's already a potentially dire problem where, yeah, I don't, I don't think you, I don't think you use that opportunity immediately to roll out, you know, a digital payment system. Now, is it an opportunity to start earnestly working on it, you know, and then rolling it out some period of months from now? Maybe, but then, you know, you still, uh, I don't know, you still face the problem of, you know, what have you really implemented? It just doesn't look, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to look very much like Bitcoin, you know, or a, you know, distributed ledger uh, crypto asset. I, it, it's possible, but it seems quite okay. unlikely. All right. Well, um, if it's, um, you know, because I was listening to this interview with uh, Anthony Pampoliano, Pomp and, and Preston Pish, and mm. uh, I mean, I'm just paraphrasing it, but you can listen to it yourself. But, uh, the, uh, but I said, you know, I would agree even with Preston Pish that um, that this, this uh, digital wall, whatever form uh, this UBI would be, you know, uh, transferred to the to the people in need uh don't you think it would be like a trigger for people like waking up and understanding for the first time you know what kind of value purchasing power has this money and bitcoin you know like and then eventually they would be sort of you know uh get into a situation um because of the circumstances the conditions to educate themselves like oh wow you know like now I can even, you know, put part of that money into Bitcoin and eventually, you know, reach that critical adoption rate. Yeah. Look, I, so I haven't listened to that interview. I mean, I, yet I intend to, um, you know, I like, I love press and stuff. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I mean, look, I can definitely, I can definitely hear the argument that if it's a new digital based system, that causes people to have to do something different than they used to, mm -hmm. and it's based on the internet, then sure, that that can certainly help break the mold um, of the existing systems that have been in place, you know, for so long. So yeah, I'll buy that argument. I think that it will, it should help to open people's minds to, oh, you know, maybe there's some, you know, maybe there's some other alternate system other than the systems I've been using for years and years and years uh, that could work. And if the system, you know, if there is something else that works, then why not this other thing that works? You know, why not this Bitcoin mm -hmm. thing? So, yeah, I, I mean, it seems like a potential positive. I'm not going to hang my hat on like, this is going to be the catalyst. If the question is like, what's going to be the catalyst for, you know, for Bitcoin. And by the way, I, I do think this is, this whole situation is pro has accelerated the timeline, you know, for Bitcoin for sure. Um, I do think it means that we're that much closer to much more accrued debt. The you know the the most likely resolution of which is inflation, and um, so we're much closer to yeah we're much closer to that inflationary environment of you know five to eight percent to eight percent you know consumer price inflation CPI or however you measure it, than we were um, recently. And in the short term, it's really hard to say. Like, it could be deflationary. We could have a deflationary demand shock, right? Because nobody's buying anything except the bare essentials. And so that will last for some period of months, and then it'll pass. And then we're in the situation of, oh, we're, I guess we're where we were before, but now there's even more debt <laughs> and even more government spending. And uh, it's hard to see how that's not ultimately inflationary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the global implications? I mean, do you do you see like like you know when you zoom out, like you know we got insolvency with German banks over here in in Europe in the European Union? Yeah, do you see like I you think the short yeah. So the short answer is we, yeah, we just we just don't know. We do know that there's a lot of debt in the system, and we know that there's a lot more debt than there was in history, and that is a destabilizing factor. So we know that. Um, I do think that, you know, I was talking earlier about, you know, Trump and re-election. 
I do think that this whole situation, you know, plays perfectly into the nationalist, um, jingoistic, you know, hostile foreign policy footing that we were sort of already on, right? Like the virus came out of China. Um, it was another attack, you know, on us. And uh, it's just, a, you know, the latest example of how stupid it was to reroute our supply chains, you know, through China, because now we really need to manufacture this essential stuff and we can't do it. And so that is, that is bad for geopolitics. I mean, that, that is, that is just a world in which hostilities are not, <laughs> they're not reduced from what they already were before. And already, you know, we were basically back in, we were in a cold war with China. I'm saying we as an American. So that's, you know, that's clearly a major, um, the major environment. Now, with respect to your question about, you know, what's going to happen to the banking system, I'm actually less worried about the banking system now than I was in the global financial crisis. Um, you know, I'm more worried about people's savings and pensions. Um, you know, and obviously I'm concerned for, you know, my clients that have, you know, significant equity exposure. Um, and so those those things are those things are concerning for me and then obviously i'm worried about the shadow banking system so if the us banking system was much better capitalized this time around than it was mm -hmm. you know 11 years ago or 12 right. years ago that's good but but yeah the the you know the systems the lending institutions and the levered vehicles you know hedge funds or otherwise are the area that i'm more concerned about and for sure that'll have knock-on effects to you know the rest of the banking system so yeah i mean overall sure i'm worried about the financial system <laughs> i mean <laughs> i wrote about it you know i spent two or three chapters in my book writing about those problems so if i was worried then then uh <laughs> then yes i'm still worried now <laughs> yeah. what about the pension funds andy do you think i mean are they aren't they really broke? I mean, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm really worried for for a lot of people. That what about the pension funds, unfunded yeah. liabilities? All these, you know, when you aggregate them together with all the global debt, which yeah. is a bubble. Uh, it's um it's a it's a huge concern. I mean, pensions in the U.S. I can speak more for you know U.S. pensions because yeah. I'm more familiar with those. You know, the, at the state level in particular, as well as corporate uh, pensions. They've been assuming, you know, seven to eight percent annualized rates of return in perpetuity, more or less. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, that was a joke. Uh, that was already a joke before this recent crisis, and now it's, yeah, it's clearly laid bare. Um, there, there is. I don't actually know the aggregate number, but it, but it must be in, you know, the trillions in yeah. terms of of, yeah. of of actual let's say underfunded liability. You won't find it on any of their balance sheets, right? Because they've got no, these ridiculous no. assumptions. Yeah. But yes, the reality no. of it is hugely, hugely, hugely. underfunded. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I worry about, I definitely worry about, you know, it's interesting. I, I'll give you specific sort of, uh, a specific example, like what I, you know, do for my business. One of the things I do for my clients is I do long-term financial projections. And one of the major, uh, areas of that or one of the major factors is like you know how much social security am i going to get right and we have always i shouldn't say always at least since 2016 but i think earlier than that you know basically had the assumption that your social security benefit is going to be in, in purchasing power terms in real terms is going to be substantially lower than you know the stated nominal rate including the fact that even though it's stated that today it's protected against inflation, right? They have escalators for, for consumer price inflation. We have for years been using the assumption that, you know, those escalators are not going to fully protect you. And yeah, I have to say, if anything, you know, my view is probably even more bearish on that than it was before. Um, and it's, I'm sure it's taken, you know, I'm sure the things that are coming to light now and the world we're living in now is unfortunately going to surprise, it's going to surprise some people. Yeah, yeah. But it's good. I mean, people are waking up, as if you might have, you know, heard or read on Twitter, and more and more people are 
are asking questions about Bitcoin. So people are waking up. That's the good thing. What I'm really intrigued is that not, you know, like, uh, let's say the average middle class, not lower class, but middle class, upper middle class hasn't really like grasped the, you know, the fundamental power of Bitcoin, you know, the, the value proposition of Bitcoin. But I think it's going to happen soon. I, I feel it. it it's, it's coming. Where, where do you see this? On, where do you see on the horizon? Like, you know, this yeah. critical where's the, where's, yeah. where's the psyche? Where's the, the you know, the, the public psyche going to go? When, when do we get that uh, mass adoption, you know, inflection point? <sighs> Came on, I wish I knew. Pain. Of course, it's the pain, you know, the suffering, yeah. the, the need, the necessity. I understand that. But uh, people, I mean, are not that stupid, I think. You know, they, they, they look around, they, they see everything, you know, they, they see what the Federal Reserve or all the central banks are doing. So it's, it's not that they're, you know, people are not stupid. But uh, what does it take to, you know, open up and, yeah. and really go into the rabbit hole? Yeah. What does it take to get... You know, what does it take to get 30% of the population invested in Bitcoin, right? Or more? Yeah, I mean, the catalysts that have, that are, that have been in my mind and continue to be in my mind are, um, one is price. So there is the psychological element of once we break through the all-time high, right? Once we blow through 19 or 20K again, then it will trigger people's memory. Because mm -hmm. that is one of the things about this thing, at least in my experience, right? Great. I think I mentioned earlier, um, that, you know, the first time, this is before we started recording, was it the first time I read about Bitcoin? I was actually in or near Vienna. I was on a trip, right? Mm -hmm. This was 2013. And I read an article about it and I totally ignored it. And then I had a second exposure a few years later and it wasn't until the third exposure, right, that it started to sink in. There's no question in my mind that there are, you know, millions of, of folks in America and I'm sure in countries in Europe and all over the world when they start reading the headlines of, oh, it's reached a new all-time high and it's still not dead. And I remember reading articles about this thing, you know, back in 2017. So that'll be a major catalyst. Um, also, just actual inflation, you know, I think popping up to more interesting levels will be a catalyst. Um, and that's going to happen. I mean, it was already going to happen. I, you know, I wrote, I wrote in the book that, that the Fed actually issued a written statement which they basically doubled down on, but this was May of 2019, where they talked about the inflation target being symmetric, right? What does that mean? It means that if our target is 2%, and according to our numbers, we've been undershooting the target for years, well, then it'd be okay to overshoot it for years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, they're going to get their wish. <laughs> I mean, they already were, but like now they've, you know, now it's clear. Now they've opened up the spigots and said, you know, we're going to print as much as it takes. So, so once people start to see, I think, a significant increase in inflation um, and a significant uh, loss to their savings, you know, that's going to grab their attention. I don't know when that, you know, I don't know when that happens in the short to medium term because we just don't know what this whole virus situation is going to look like. In but the short term, happen, it's deflationary. Right. It could happen real fast, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, it could happen real fast. I mean, like, we could be out of this thing and, and having taken on a bunch more government debt and having printed a bunch of money, you know, six months from now right. and inflation starts to pike to spike and people start saying, Oh my God, it's like, it's happening. It's, you know, it's 2020. That is entirely possible. You know, along at the same time that we got the having right. And you know, the supply cut, um, it is very possible that we could see a, a massive spike, you know, this year, um, or it could take longer. You're not going to pin me down. Uh, you're not going to pin me down on the. Time. No, no, no. I don't want it. <laughs> no, no. I just wanted to know. You know what? What do you see on the horizon, and how do you see this? Uh, you know, unfolding. So, yeah, um, Andy. I don't want to take too much time. I, mean, I would love to you continue this maybe in a panel discussion with other Bitcoiners uh, in the you know near future. Uh, where can people find you? Do you want to like share your? Intro? Yeah, cool. No, it's been it's been fun uh, talking to you, Kayvon. Um I, you know, obviously the, the book is called Why Buy Bitcoin? Investing Today in the Money of Tomorrow, and it's on Amazon. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's Edstrom Andrew at G, or uh, it's Edstrom Andrew is the, um, is the handle. Um, you know, my firm is called West Cap Group. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, those are, uh, those are the, oh, and I have a personal website, you know, andyedstrom.com. And I do okay. have a list of all my, you know, podcast that. appearances. I've done, I think about seven of them. Okay. And uh, I will certainly add this one uh, to that list. So 
All right. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a pleasure. It's wild times. I feel like we barely uh, scratched the surface on uh, some of the stuff that's uh, that's going on. But yeah, suffice to say, there's a lot of Bitcoiners out there. I'm sure in your audience who are saying it's happening, like it's happening now. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I hope they're right. I kind of think uh, at minimum, I think that the timeline has been significantly uh, accelerated uh, from where it was before. Right. Andy, stay healthy, um, take good care, and hope you know to uh, stay in touch with me. All right, for the future. Yeah, we'll do, Kevin. Have a good okay. one. Bye bye. All right, what you think about this really interesting conversation with Andy Edstrom, the author of uh, this amazing book, Why Buy Bitcoin? Uh, with the subtitle investing today in the money of tomorrow and should definitely check it out it's really really well written really well researched uh can only recommend it if you if you loved it as much as i did please give it a like uh love it share it retweet it uh follow me uh, also follow andy adstrom on twitter and would also you know appreciate a, a positive review on any podcast platform if you are you know, ethical Bitcoin sponsor, get in touch with me. My email address is hello at the total And I uh, would really thank you so much for listening and for your support to all my listeners, my followers, my subscribers. Subscribe, please. And uh, hope we can, yeah, continue uh, these conversations in the very near future. Um, and thank you so much again. Bye. Mm-hmm.